Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining this Zoom webinar tonight. I'd also like to thank the Milne Library for sponsoring this event and Kira Bingaman, who introduced me and who will host the Q&A session to follow. Thanks also to Anne Lowry Grand, who provided a copy of her memoir of life at Clover Hill, and Catherine Lowry Grand, who provided a copy, uh, sorry, Catherine Lowry Boyt, who sent me a virtual copy of the Lowry family history that she compiled. I think they're both with us tonight. Thanks to the members of the Grazer family, also on this Zoom call, who provided me with photos and memories. To Taylor Zasloff of Williamstown for a copy of her 2013 booklet on the importance of preserving the town owned Lowry property as open space. And finally, to Carolyn Henderson, who graciously gave me a tour of the farm. So now let's take a look together at Clover Hill Farm. There's an active farm close to the center of Williamstown, just half a mile from Spring Street. And notice here's Main Street. Uh, here's Water Street. There's the Green River. There's Clover Hill Farm. But unless you've visited the top of East Lawn Cemetery, the chances are you've never seen this farm. Located as it is on the other side of the Green River, up a long driveway from Adams Road. That's that's the view that you might have you 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 have of Clover Hill Farm if you're standing down at Cumberland Farms across Route Two. Looking south from Cumberland Farms, you can glimpse the current farmhouse on the top of the hill. For more than a hundred years, it has been operated as Clover Hill Farm first as a dairy farm, and for the last 50 years as a horse farm. But its colorful history goes back to the founding of Williamstown. Nehemiah Smedley, one of the earliest settlers of Williamstown, had a 177 acre farm to the east of Green River, extending southward from today's East Main Street. Here's uh, the farm, here's Route 2 or Main Street, there is Water Street, there is Stratton Road, and there's the Green River. Uh, this lot number 29 is the farm in question. <clears throat> His farm extended southward from Main Street uh, <clears throat> uh, from, from today's East Main Street, sorry. The farmhouse still stands east of the Green River, just west of Colonial Village on the north side of East Main Street. In 1789, Smedley left that house and the farm to two sons, Levi and Elijah, who operated the farm together. Then in 1792, Elijah built a house for himself a little to the east of the family homestead on what is now the north side of Adams Road, where the Orchards Hotel is now located. Why, one might ask, did the old Smedley farm dating from the 18th century survive as a farm until now? Probably for several reasons. The original Williamstown house lots, and here you see them, these are the original house lots uh, here and on, the other, on each side of, of uh, Route 2 of Main Street, those original lots stopped at the Green River. The land east of the river was intended for farm fields. Until 60 years ago, in fact, most of the land in Williamstown east of the Green River was still being farmed. Even though a bridge over the Green River was built shortly after the town was settled, the river remained a sort of psychological boundary. The development of East Lawn Cemetery, beginning in 1842, and it's right here, cut the farm off from Main Street. Although a second bridge, 
was built in the late 19th century right here. It doesn't show on this map. <laughs> Linking Water Street and the so-called Mount Pleasant. It's occupied now by what's called Linear Park. And a few structures were built on the high ground. <clears throat> the open land and, and uh, the open land to the south, right along the river, was a floodplain and unsuitable for building. After Elijah Smedley's death in 1846, his house and farm were owned by his daughter Mary and his son-in-law Asahel. Uh, As their, their family name was Foot, Asahel Foot. There he is on the 1876 map. Again, here is Main Street. Uh, here is Stratton Road, Adams Road. This is before uh, before uh, Route Two was continued approximately along this line. Sorry. Foot graduated from Williams College in 1827, planted apple orchards, hence the name of the hotel on the site now, and kept a private school. In 1842, he gave some land to the town for East Lawn Cemetery. At the time, his farm consisted of the high ground west of Stratton Road, the land down along Green River belonged to the Twine Factory on Water Street, which ran its looms with water power generated by a dam behind which a large pond or reservoir backed up. There's an 1876 map showing Main Street, Water Street, what's now Cable Mills, what used to be a big reservoir or pond to power the mills. After Foot died in 1882, his daughters inherited the property and sold the house, but not the farm, to Frank Markham, a New York banker who used it as a summer residence. Markham, one of the owners of the town water company, improved the house, and he and his family spent summers there in the 1880s and 1890s. The house survived on the site until 1984 when it was moved to Stratton Road. Here's, I apologize for this picture, it's from Zillow. Uh, uh, house is still there, I uh, lived in. Uh, <clears throat> the house was moved from its original site to make room for the building of the orchards. The foot farm, separated from the house, was sold in the 1850s to George Wells Smedley, first cousin of Foote's wife. Born in Virginia, this George Wells Smedley was farming in Vermont in the 1840s before moving to Williamstown. His farmhouse, no longer there, seems to have been close to Stratton Road. You can see F. <clears throat> F. G. Smedley right here, that's apparently his house. <clears throat> right there. His son, Frederick George Smedley, an 1864 graduate of Williams College, became a prominent New York City lawyer, and at his father's death, he inherited the farm, visiting it with his family in the summer. Frederick Smedley sold the farm to Markham, who already owned the old Elijah Smedley house on Adams Road, and now apparently found it desirable to own the abutting property, thereby reconnecting the separated parts of the old Smedley Foot Farm. He apparently called it Meadowvale Farm. The hill rising to the west of Markham's house came to be called Markham Hill. But in 1893, Markham sold the 33 acre farm on the west side of Stratton Road to E.R. Vale of Troy. Uh, here you see his name on the 1894 map. The old Meadowvale parcel over here on the east side of Stratton Road was acquired by George Walker, who made plans to build a green, greenhouses and to raise vegetables. Ezra Vale, a prominent businessman, had been renting houses in Williamstown for several summers and planned to build a substantial summer home for himself. 
He hired an architect who in 1894 designed a substantial coachman's house and barn, uh, along with a separate gardener's cottage. The drawings were published in an architectural magazine and the gardener's cottage, considerably grander than Williamstown Farms had seen, was built just down the long driveway from uh, today's house. In the summer of 1895, while it was being constructed, Vale and his family rented a house in Williamstown, but he was in ill health and died in Williamstown later that year. The farm with a new farmhouse and old barns on Markham Hill uh, were put up for sale in 1895, but the property was not sold until 1911. During those intervening 16 years, it was owned by his estate and was probably operated by a tenant farmer. In November 1911, the farm was bought by George Lowry. Lowry from Petersburg, New York, came over the mountain as a young man to work on the farms in South Williamstown. In time, he married Blanche Pease, whose family owned two farms on Oblong Road, including the Sweet Farm, which she and her husband inherited. He also managed Three Brook Farm down the road for its absentee owner. Here's a picture of, of uh, George and Blanche. They apparently wanted their own place, and maybe they saw a better farming opportunity east of Green River and bought 23 acres on what is now Adams Road, just south of East Lawn Cemetery from Ezra Vale's estate for $3,300. They named it Clover Hill Farm, perhaps after Clover Hill, a historic house in County Cavan, Ireland, where the Lowry family originated. In their first years, the Lowrys, who had two children, Floyd, born in 1899, and Rachel, born in 1909, lived in the 1894 Vale House. He put in a spring house, started a dairy herd, and drew alfalfa and clover to feed his stock. There was a horse barn and a milk house, Floyd lived at home and helped his father with the farm and then did a two-year course at Massachusetts Agricultural College, Mass Aggie, the predecessor of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. In 1918, George bought the milk route, the milk wagon and equipment from Sweet Brook Farm on Oblong Road and made plans to deliver 600 to 800 quarts of milk per day to retail customers. He experimented with growing more alfalfa and installed a modern pasteurizing plant. In 1921, he bought an old house on East Main Street and moved it down the street to a new foundation. The family apparently needed more room. In 1923, his son Floyd married a neighbor girl from Stratton Road and the young couple lived in the relocated house. Over time, George also bought additional land from neighbors, including the low-lying land next to Green River. Here's a, a recent photo of it. I took it just a few weeks ago. I'm standing in East Lawn Cemetery, looking downhill onto low land. There's the river, uh, Green River flowing uh, in the background. Uh, this low-lying land uh, next to the river had once been inundated by the mill pond behind the Twine Mill uh, Dam on the river and was later drained when the mill converted from water power to electricity and the owners removed the dam. There's a picture of what the big reservoir or pond looked like when it was full. According to the state DEP, this low ground along the river on the near side is still wetland, a floodplain, and cannot be built on. In 1934, George also bought about 50 acres along Stratton Road from Horace Herrick, who lived on Cole Avenue and ran a coal business. But like many businessmen in town, 
he also owned a farm. Part of the Herrick farm was used as a grass airfield during the early days of aviation. Here's a photo uh, <clears throat> of uh, a plane sitting in the grass field, a couple of kids getting their picture taken. Uh, <clears throat> that's Prospect Mountain in the background. This is a photo courtesy of Mike Miller. In the 1930s, the Lowry farm was one of the larger farms in town, but Lowry still plowed and cut his fields as most farmers did in those years with horse-drawn equipment. In 1932, the Lowrys bought more purebred Guernseys, eventually building up a herd of 100 cows. They established a milk route, delivering milk to local customers. Here's a picture of their delivery van. But then in 1935, Floyd and his wife divorced, and he moved out to Illinois, where he remarried and worked for a dairy co-op. Meanwhile, back in Williamstown, his father, George, apparently had some trouble covering his expenses. Like many farmers during the Depression, he was behind on his property taxes. In 1937, he cut back, selling his milk route to a South Williamstown farmer. Here's a picture of George with some of his friends. Then in the winter of 1937-38, while pruning apple trees, George fell and broke his arm. This meant he could no longer run the farm on his own. He persuaded his son Floyd to come back to Williamstown from Illinois to help, help him out. George and Floyd put in a new pasteurizing plant and advertised plans to establish a milk route. Here's a photo of, of Lowry's Clover Hill Farm milk bottle that's uh, part of the collection at the Williamstown Historical Museum. The farm in these years must have been a smaller operation than in the early 1930s. The dairy herd was only 37 cows in 1942. That, as it happens, was a bad year for the Lowrys. In a major fire in their cow barn in April 1942, they lost 16 cows. Lowry had to hire a local construction company to dig a big pit, and the dead cows were buried right there on the farm. In June of that year, Ruth Lowry was hospitalized, George's wife, hospitalized with double pneumonia. And five-year-old David suffered a concussion when he hit his head on the barn's concrete floor. And in July, George broke his hip after being thrown from a buggy when the horse bolted. But the Lowry's carried on. And in 1943, bought George Walker's 100 acre Meadowvale farm, south of Adams Road and east of Stratton Road, with a large red barn and a slate roof. And they thus succeeded in reuniting the two parts of the old Smedley Foot farm. They moved their cows and hay along with the equipment that survived from the fire a quarter mile up Stratton Road to the Meadowvale cow barn. Now at its peak, Clover Hill Farm comprised more than 200 acres on both sides of Stratton Road, bounded on the west by Green River, on the north by East Lawn Cemetery. George Lowry died in July 1944 at the age of 72, and the farm passed to his children, Floyd, who'd already been operating it for years, and Rachel, it's not a very good picture of Rachel here, Floyd by then had four children, David, Anne, uh, <clears throat> uh, and sorry, David, Anne, and Floyd Jr., known as Sonny, who all grew up on the farm. I've left out one of the children. <clears throat> In the late 1930s, a girl from Hancock named Eleanor Williams, nicknamed Noni, was hired to clean and cook. When she was 15, Anne Lowry wrote an account of her family's life at Clover Hill for a school assignment. My parents, she wrote, work hard for a lot of hours. Her three brothers, she said, have to get up very early in the morning. 
to do their chores and they don't like it. They would rather sleep until the 1950s. Dairy cows on Williamstown dairy farms were brought in from the pasture each day for milking. She also wrote accounts of riding the bus with her grandfather, of the barn fire in 1942, and of Noni's wedding in 1945. Many years later, she wrote a long memoir about her early years on the farm. Until his own children were old enough to do farm chores, George Lowry hired local boys to help out on the farm. One was Charles Foist, known to the family as Charlie, who lived with his mother on East Main Street near the Wally Bridge and came to work on the farm in 1938 when he was only 14. He was already six feet tall and weighed 200 pounds. Here's a not very good picture of Charlie, but you get an idea how big he was. Paid by the hour, he carried milk cans, plowed fields, and repaired farm machinery, working very closely with Floyd Lowry as his right-hand man, and in effect became part of the family. When in 1941, Floyd bought a farm all tractor, young Charlie, not yet old enough to get a driver's license, was in charge of it. In 1942, Charlie enlisted in the Marines and served in combat in the Western Pacific, where he experienced the horrors of war firsthand. After the war, Charlie returned to the farm. In 1948, he married, and in 1949, Floyd Lowry gave him a building lot on Stratton Road. Another of Floyd's hired men in the late 30s was Richard Gravel, who grew up on nearby Mill Street in Williamstown and went to work at Clover Hill after he graduated from Williamstown High School. He too enlisted in the Marines in 1942. And when he returned, bought a farm on Hancock Road. Gravel's neighbor on Mill Street, Harold Moon, was also working at Clover Hill at the time of the 1942 barn fire. When Charlie and the others went off to war, Floyd hired other boys to serve as farm hands. During the war, Floyd's sister, Rachel, drove the milk delivery truck. Floyd Lowry ran the dairy farm, continuing to produce milk until the mid 1960s. In 1946, he bought out his sister's interest in the farm. Floyd delivered milk to stores and restaurants, and his sister Rachel delivered house to house. Regular customers in the 50s included Fanny Tash. Here's a sign of Fanny in front of her store on Water Street. <clears throat> Though you can't read it, this sign up here says Lowry's Clover Hill Farm Milk. They also delivered, she also delivered to Phillips General Store at the corner of Water Street and Main Street and La Plants Market on Cole Avenue. Restaurants included the Taconic Park, south of town, the College Restaurant on Spring Street, and the predecessor of the Chef's Hat on Simons Road. But farming was an uncertain business. In 1957, Floyd failed to get the contract to supply milk to the town's schools. And farming was also a dangerous business. In October 1958, Floyd's 40 foot tile lined silo hit by lightning earlier in the year suddenly collapsed, scattering 200 tons of silage all over the farmyard. It made the papers. Two years later, while working atop the new silo at the farm, Charlie fell his head landing on a protruding lag bolt in the foundation that penetrated his head and fractured his skull. He was disabled and no longer able to keep a full-time job and was reported to never quite the same again, but continued to work part-time at Clover Hill Farm. As the Lowry children grew up, it became clear that none of them wanted to go into farming as a life's work. Beginning in the mid 50s, when his youngest son was 26, and with farm income uncertain, Floyd sold off parcels of land to pay the mortgages and property taxes. In 1956, he sold 30 acres on the west side of Stratton Road to the town of Williamstown 
for $29,000 uh, for the, the site for a proposed new high school. But the town decided instead to build that school on Cold Spring Road south of town and Floyd continued to hate the farm fields. The so-called Lowry property, uh, immediately to the south of uh, present-day Clover Hill, ha has its own history. Owned by the town, in 1987, it was formally put into conservation through a complicated procedure involving a recommendation from the Conservation Commission, a vote at town meeting, and approval by the state. Three years later, a group of citizens proposed building affordable housing on the site, but the town declined to try to remove the land from conservation, which would have required a long, arduous, and uncertain process involving a unanimous vote of the Conservation Commission and Select Board, a supermajority vote at town meeting, a majority vote in the state legislature, and approval by the State Office of Environmental Affairs. In 2003, after the town's 2002 master plan recommended citing affordable housing on the town-owned Lowry property, the town again considered, but rejected, a proposal to spend Community Preservation Commission funds on a feasibility study. In 2013, after the flood at the Spruces, Proposals were again made, this time by the Affordable Housing Committee, to seek state approval to remove the land from conservation and to site affordable housing on 10 acres of the property. Here's the design for the, <clears throat> for the housing, published in I Berkshire's actually in 2013. The select board initially supported the project, but encountered local objections from those who thought it important to retain open land and argued that from the site without sidewalks or bus service on Stratton Road, it was difficult to reach the town center. The select board later reversed itself. The land remains in conservation, now hayed by local farmer Kim Wells and is crossed by a hiking trail that follows an old farm road. Williamstown Rural Lands is currently exploring a proposal to develop a hiking and riding trail that would link the Lowry property to Clover Hill Farm. Beginning in 1959, Lowry sold more land at the corner of Stratton and Adams Road for what became Doctors Park and along Stratton Road and Adams Road for housing lots. His neighbors thought he'd got a very good price. His youngest son, Floyd Jr., set himself up as a builder and developer of Clover Hill West. Here's an ad in the local paper uh, <clears throat> for building uh, split level houses uh, at Clover Hill West, uh, <clears throat> formerly a portion of the Lowry property. While other farmers were shifting to Holsteins, Lowry stuck mostly with his Guernseys. In the late 1950s, he decided not to incur the expense of replacing his obsolete pasteurizing plant and started sending his milk to North Adams to be pasteurized. In time, he sold his milk route and after buying an expensive stainless steel holding tank, gave up milk production altogether and decided to join a Springfield milk co-op which picked up his raw milk. Then in 1966, Floyd Sr. apparently decided to shut down his dairy farm. Dairy farms had been closing down all over New England. Other dairy farms in town lasted for another 15 to 20 years, including Fritz Langer's on Stone Hill, Art Rosenberg's on Cold Spring Road, Quentin Young's on Sloan Road, and Bert Eldridge's on the New Ashford Road. Why did Clover Hill close down in 1966? Probably for several reasons. Floyd was 67 years old and ready to retire. The children did not want to take over from him as he had taken over from his father. He could no longer count on Charlie to work full time and local developers approached him with a very good offer. 
He sold off his cows to local farmers and an auction house and then sold the cow barn and 84 acres of the old Walker farm east of Stratton Road to the Stratton Development Corporation, a consortium of local investors who had plans to lay out 95 building sites. Beginning in 1968, they put in Stratton Estates. Uh, that's today's Candlewood Drive, Stony Ledge Road, Holly Lane, Cobble View Road, and Sycamore Drive. They planned to convert the old barn on the property to the Stratton Recreational Barn for the benefit of homo homeowners in the development. <clears throat> that plan was never realized. The barn stood empty until it was demolished in 1984. They also built the Stratton Apartments on a separate parcel on the west side of Stratton Road. Floyd remained at Clover Hill for another seven years. To keep busy, he helped out part-time at the nearby Chennai Farm on Patterson Road. In 1969, his wife Ruth died after a stroke. Three years later, he gave his daughter Anne and her husband Robert Grand a building lot with frontage on Stratton Road. Anne's three brothers all lived out of town. And in 1973, at age 74, Floyd sold the remainder of the home farm to the Grazers. Emily and Laird Grazer had met in the Peace Corps, been graduate students together at Cornell, where they lived on a farm and had a horse, and then lived for a couple of years on a commune in Arkansas, where they acquired more horses. While the Grazers were visiting old friends, John and Adelaide England, who lived on Water Street, <clears throat> where they ran a studio and shop called the Potter's Wheel, they were told by these old friends that what the town needed was a good riding stable. Clover Hill Farm, right across the Green River from their friends, was for sale. The Grazers took a look and quickly bought it. After selling to the Grazers, Floyd spent the rest of his life living with his sister Rachel in her house on Green River Road. He died in 1980 at the age of 80. His old farmhand friend, Charlie Foist, died of a heart attack just 20 months later. The Grazers turned the Lowry Dairy Farm into a horse farm, and it's been a horse farm ever since. Here's young Emily carrying a couple of hay bales. In 1973, when they bought, Horseback riding was still a popular activity in Williamstown and was a featured event at the annual Grange Fair in the summertime. Local kids could ride at Taconic Stables on Oblong Road, but there was no place devoted to riding lessons. Bonnie Lee Farm on North Street did not open until 1993, and Godfrey Horse Stables on Henderson Road was mostly devoted to training trotters. The Grazers, with their two young children, lived at Clover Hill in the tall 1894 house. The farm still had an array of outbuildings that had been not been used for years, a carriage barn, a hay barn, tool shed, and milk house. Horses were initially kept in the carriage barn. The Grazers inherited from Floyd Lowry an old cow who continued to, con to provide fresh milk for years. Toby, a goat who liked to hang around the barns, and a couple of barn cats. They immediately set about building a 60 by 66 foot stable and a 70 by 135 foot indoor riding arena. Here's a picture in the paper of Floyd Lowry on the left with Laird Grazer on the right as that is being built. The old silage pit was filled in and became the site of an outdoor riding ring. They owned a string of horses, including a couple of thoroughbreds named Royal Chat and Chip, and an old draft horse named Brownie, who was safe for kids to ride. Chip, or Chippy, was a smart horse who, so Laird Grays remembers, could make any kid look good. A pony named Nikki was Emily's favorite, 
and Dynamite, Laird's favorite, was a great endurance ride horse. They also bought a nine-year-old thoroughbred gelding named Scottish Lancer, who had raced at Green Mountain Track from 1970 to 72. He proved to be too feisty for the riding academy. Running flat out down on the flats beside Green River, he was the fastest horse Emily had ever ridden. So they put Scottish Lancer into serious training and raced him with some success back at Green Mountain Track in 75 and 76. They also boarded another 13 horses and ran a riding school for children and adults. In the early days, their students included young Patrick Quinn, who's on the call tonight. <clears throat> Patrick, who remembers nearly 50 years later that he was the only boy in an equestrian class and that the lessons were of the Prussian model, that is to say, pretty rigorous. Another student, Professor Frank Oakley from Williams College, learned to jump. He and his wife, Claire Ann, bought a gray gelding from Emily Grazer and boarded him at Clover Hill. As most of you know, the Oakleys still keep horses. Dave Simons, now a documentary filmmaker with an interest in small New England farms, lived nearby when he was a kid and helped muck out stalls. And through the 1970s, the farm put on in invitational horse shows in which riders from all around New England competed and riders who had learned to, uh, to ride at Clover Hill and boarded their horses there could demonstrate their skills. A handsome wooden sign carved by Laird Grazer proclaiming the farm's name hung at the bottom of the driveway. There were regular reports on the horse shows in the North Adams transcript, announcing the names of the winning riders and horses in 27 different classes, from novice equitation to hunter. Then in 1977, Clover Hill was briefly in the news in connection not with horse shows, but with a murder in North Adams, when suspicion was initially cast on a man who boarded a horse at the farm. It was even rumored that the dead body, later discovered some 10 miles east of North Adams, could have been temporarily hidden on the farm property in a manure pile. How this lurid rumor arose will probably never be known. Perhaps it was imagined by somebody who heard something about a mass burial of cows there 35 years earlier. Emily Grazer had to explain to members of the grand jury who visited the farm that farmers did not stockpile horse manure, but distributed it on the fields with a manure spreader. In any event, the crime was solved when the real murderer, another man altogether, confessed. The Grazers stayed for 14 years. The kids, Kate and Chris, went to Pine Cobble School and Chris went on to Mount Greylock Regional High School. Because of daily farm chores, he was not able to play school sports in the afternoon. And because the house looked like a classic haunted house on a hill, so Chris remembers, they never had any trick-or-treaters on Halloween. By the late 1980s, Emily Grazer, now divorced, had been taking care of the farm by herself for some years. A local farmer, Averill Cook, hayed their fields, but she was finding running a, a riding stable more than she wanted, especially during the cold winters. When Chris went off to college in 1987, she sold the farm, then containing 44 acres to a couple from New Jersey, Jesse Prokop and her husband, Dan Coffey, who thought they wanted to run a riding stable. Jesse Prokop began renovating the old three-story farmhouse in which the Lowrys and Grazers had lived, removing the top two stories, but ran out of money and didn't finish the job. She continued to board horses and to run a riding school, but within a year, she fell behind on her monthly payments on two mortgages and then on her property taxes. She and her husband kept up a brave front and testified in opposition to plans to build affordable housing on the town-owned Lowry property on the grounds that it would result in the drainage of toxic materials onto their farm. 
They declared that they were, quote, committed to the farm for the long term and intended to spend the rest of their lives there. But later that year, the bank foreclosed on the first mortgage and she defaulted on the second. The land was bought by an abutter, David Carver, who wanted to protect it from development. The farm stood idle, the grounds overgrown, and the buildings vandalized. In 1994, 1993, Carver sold most of the farm, then about 40 acres, to Carolyn Henderson and her husband, Robert Mickley, who owned horses and, like Jesse Prokop and the grazers before them, ran it as a horse farm. They rebuilt the main barn, built new horse stalls, boarded horses, offered riding instruction, and put in riding trails, including one that runs along the Green River. The farm received the Massachusetts Farm Bureau Horse Farm of Distinction Award a number of times. For many years, its horses and riders participated in the annual 4th of July parade through Williamstown. The old Lowry house, half demolished with a leaky roof, was uninhabitable. For the first seven years, Carolyn Henderson and her husband lived in a condo nearby on Windflower Way off Stratton Road. In 2000, they built a large post and beam house on the site of the old riding ring, took down the remains of the old Lowry house, and built a new riding ring. You can see the East Lawn Cemetery in the background there. In 2003 and 2007, they bought adjoining land, and today the farm consists of about 40 acres. Here's an aerial shot taken by Mike Miller about 10 years ago. Carolyn Henderson no longer offers riding instruction, but her five horses share the farm with goats, ducks, beagles, and cats. She continues to operate Clover Hill Farm as a boarding stable for horses and as a pet-friendly country inn with a 1,200 square foot guest house and rooms in the main house. The website promises walking distance to downtown Williamstown and 360 degree mountain views. Today, Clover Hill is one of only two farms in Williamstown east of the river. The Shanais on Patterson Road operate the only other farm. Kim Wells cuts hay on Clover Hill and on the town owned Lowry property. Hay is also cut on old farm fields further south on Stratton Road. Carolyn Henderson plans to remain at Clover Hill until the last of her horses dies, perhaps five years from now. When she sells, she hopes to attract a buyer looking for what real estate agents call equine property. Who, somebody who wants to keep horses and wants to make use of the farm's barn, paddock, riding arena, pastures, and riding trails. Speaking as a local historian, I hope that she finds a buyer who wants to keep horses. For the farm we now call Clover Hill, surviving for more than 240 years, is an outward and visible link to the original architectural origins of Williamstown, agricultural origins of Williamstown in the 18th century. But it's a place with more than historical value. Its mere presence adds to the visual quality of life for anybody who lives in town or comes here as a visitor. At a time when Williamstown is considering whether or not to adopt a rezoning ordinance permitting the development of multifamily apartment buildings in what is now agricultural land on the outskirts of town, we should recognize the importance of preserving open space, especially these fields, pastures, and farm buildings visible from East Lawn Cemetery, from Adams Road, and from the new Cable Mills condos across the Green River. Thanks very much. Wonderful, thank you, Dusty. Um,
so now we will open it up to questions. If you have a question, could you uh, please type it into the chat box? There is a chat um, icon at the bottom of your screen if you move your mouse, your um, cursor around and you can type in a question and I, I will read them out loud. While we're waiting for, for uh, if there are any questions, I would <clears throat> I'll just say welcome again to members of the Lowry and Grazer family who were on the call tonight. Uh, and if they've got any comments or stories they'd like to add, I'd very much like to hear them. Jane Forrestal said, thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. I believe she said she took writing lessons. She did writing there for a few years earlier in the talk too. Well, maybe she can. Maybe she got a, got a story to tell. She said, she said that she has a trumpet player <laughs> in the background, so she can't she can't talk right now. Josh Laurie said the pool at Union College was named Foot Pool. Well, that's interesting. I don't know, Foote's not, a not unusual name. I don't know whether there's any connection between the Foote family at Williamstown and the Foote family at Williams College. Uh, sorry, at Union College. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I will share my, I'm Catherine Lowry. My dad was Floyd Peace Jr. or Sonny. Um, he shared with me that his favorite thing on the farm was to take the tractor as deep as he could get it in the mud until he had to go ask his dad for another tractor to get it out. <laughs> That's a good story. Thank you. If you've got any other stories to, that you could pass on, please do tell us. I just remembered he also shared just when chemicals and pesticides were starting to be used, um, the sadness that his dad felt knowing that it wasn't the way to farm and really struggling to compete in that new environment. Like they were right there in the forefront <laughs> of watching farming change and it really impacted them. Thank you. That's where they, they so the, their dairy farm then was, it was clearly affected by the big changes uh, taking place around New England and around the country, uh, that <clears throat> pesticides were certain, apart from the damage they can do, uh, that adds to the cost uh, of farming. And it looks like uh, at, at the end, in the 50s, uh, the costs were simply too high. Um, someone asked. Uh, Josh Laurie asked, are there any therapeutic course programs today? Well, uh, if, if Carolyn Henderson is on the call, I'm not sure she is, she would be the one to answer that one. I think there are, there are no, uh, not currently any therapeutic course programs. Uh, whether there, what, there were any over the years, I don't know. So, um, Helen Smith shared a photo from above the farm from about five years ago. And if you go in the chat box, you can open it and, and see it. That, that's the picture there. It looks like that's the back with solar panels on it. I think we're looking to the north uh, <clears throat> uh, toward Vermont, uh, solar panels on the roof. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, does anybody have a, have a question for Dusty? Hi, I have a question now that I can speak. <laughs> we just had the um, trumpet practice end. Um, again, my name is Jane. Uh, we're new to, I grew up here, uh, part of my childhood in Williamstown, but we're newly back here living uh, just down the hill from the farm. Every day that we wake up, we look out the back. We live next door to, the, um, I don't know if you know where Marianne and Bill Judge live on Main Street, we're next door to them. But anyway, um, I'm curious, Dustin, if you've done any research on the house we're in, uh, because it, 
it's very old and i have a suspicion that it used to be a carriage barn or something so i don't know if in the process of researching all this other land and and uh structures if you have any information about this place at number 529 main street but we love being 529, here 529 east main street right right main street yeah we love Good. being here uh, and the, I, all the great memories of of um the farm for me as a kid looking up the hill and seeing the animals come down in the good weather it's hard for them now because there's been so much ice and mud uh i the, in answer to your question uh i don't think uh i can tell you anything about the house at 529 east main street but it would not be surprising uh if it if, if it's a converted carriage barn i can tell you uh, uh, how you could go about finding out uh, about the house. Uh, and the, uh, the, the first thing I would do is uh, go to the uh, Registry of Deeds in Adams, which is open to the public. It's about nine to four or 4.30 weekdays. Mm -hmm. And you can, in effect, find out by looking up the, first you look up your name to start with as a, uh, in the the in the list of grantees, that is to say, people to whom the land, the buyer, grantee, grantor, grantee, grantor means seller, grantee means buyer. Mm -hmm. Look up, uh, you'll you'll find the name of the seller, and then if you look his name up or her name up as a grantee, you can, by, step by step, go back to the beginning, uh, to the earliest the earliest time that that property was sold. Okay. Uh, the most recent deeds going back to about 1953 are available online. And if you go to the uh, registry of deeds, Adams, uh, and, and sort of follow your nose, uh, you can actually see the, the deeds on, the, on your screen at home going back to 1953. Beyond earlier than that, you'll have to look at the crumbling volumes uh, in mm -hmm. the registry of deeds itself. Oh, that's great. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. Okay, so someone, uh, Catherine Lowry asked the question, can you say more about the place in Ireland that inspired the name? Uh, I, I found out about the Clover Hill in Ireland only from you, that is to say from, the, from your family history. Uh, so all I know about it is what I, I discovered by reading the work that you have done, uh, it's the sort of thing that you can, that's, that can be pursued. Uh, and it's, uh, so I would encourage you to do that. It's amazing how much you can uh, discover by noodling around the internet, starting with the name Clover Hill, uh, County Cavan, Ireland, uh, and seeing what comes up. Okay, Tim Lowry said, wonderful presentation, Dustin. And Catherine Lowry said, I'll check in with the other Catherine Lowry, thanks. Good, thank you, Lowry's. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you were here and thank you again for the, for the uh, help that you provided to me to, uh, in uh, enabling me to tell this story. Well, oh, they, 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 Jane Forrest, Forrest just simply needs the name of the owner uh, so she'd look up the, the owner's name, uh, and uh, and then uh, she could find out the, the the previous owner and the one before that and the one before that. Frequently, deeds will also uh, not only give you the name of the uh, of the buyer and the seller and the amount that a house was sold for, uh, but will, it will describe it in some detail. And sometimes we'll throw in incidental information might even actually the phrase carriage house uh, m might even appear or carriage barn might even appear somewhere in the deed. I have a, a, a quick question. Um, is Dave Simons, is he also a filmmaker that's um, helping to make films about the loss of dairy farms in the Berkshires? That's, that's, the, that's the one. Okay. Yes, indeed. And I don't know whether Dave's on the call tonight or not, but uh, he told me that he, uh, as a when he was young, when he was a kid, uh, <clears throat> to make a little money, he helped to muck out the stalls at the uh, at Clover Hill. 
He lived, okay. I believe he lived on uh, uh, south on Stratton Road at the time. Okay, yeah, I think I know who that is. Okay. Alrighty, does anyone else have a question? Does anybody know about that biplane? Can somebody talk a little bit more about the biplane? I'd like to skydive and land in the field up there someday. But does anybody know about them? I don't know anything about that biplane, except that there was a small grass airfield uh, on Herrick's farm uh, off of Stratton Road. Mike Miller is my informant on that one. I think Mike, he, he'd be the guy that I would talk to. Uh, he knows a little bit, uh, I think, about early aviation in Williamstown. There were several different airfields, including one, uh, you know, a, a bigger one where the where Mount Greylock High School is now located. Uh, but this was a little, just a little place, uh, essentially a field that the farmer mowed a little bit, did and uh, actually didn't. By the by, the look of that picture, it didn't look like he mowed it very close. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, flat enough. Uh, and big enough for a small plane to land. Okay, great. So, um, Dusty, do you want to say anything else or? I think that's, I'll just say uh, uh, thanks to everybody for coming uh, and especially thanks to those uh, who helped me out with my research and to those who had stories to tell uh, during the Q&A. Uh, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful little farm, uh, and I encourage anybody and everybody to take a look at it. Uh, maybe the best that you can get a good long view, as I say, if you, if when you're filling your car with gas at Cumberland Farms, just look across the road, and you can get a better view if you walk, drive up to the top of East Lawn Cemetery and look across the fence. I, I could just add a couple of comments about uh, visiting the farm as we've had some family come from out of town who stayed up there. And it's really a lovely place to stay, especially if you have a dog because they have so many animals. They have beagles and then they've, of course, got the ducks and the geese and the goats. And um, Carolyn is quite friendly if you would like to take a walk up there or even drive up in your car. Um, she is um, very welcoming and of course she just asks people to be respectful of the she has some horses the older retired horses who you may know this already they're allowed to just wander <laughs> so it's sort of their their um their uh privilege as being the senior the elder horses <laughs> but um yeah she carolyn's very welcoming and uh also if you have uh, a group gathering, family coming from out of town, I would definitely encourage inquiring with her about her availability and so forth, because it's pretty affordable too. It's very nice. Thanks very much. I'm sure Carolyn thanks you too. Okay. Well, uh, Kira, again, thanks very much for hosting this and uh, uh, thank you all for coming.